please just click that link. And we'll get started in about 30 seconds. I just saw a bunch of people come in. So welcome. Come on into the space. If you just joined, please click on the link in the chat and make a copy. And I will explain how this document works in just a moment. Sarah, are we ready? Yep, let's go. All right, great. So as a reminder, this is a webinar for credit. If you do want the credit, it's 1.25 hours. Um, and really how this works is once we're finished with this experience, I need about a day or two to put an attendance into a different system. And once I click the magic buttons, it will automatically send you a survey. It's a very quick five question survey. Then you'll be able to print your own certificate for your credit. The way you're gonna know that I'm done and I've done all those tasks is I will send you a follow-up email as well that says, hey, I'm, I'm done, everything's ready. So let's get started. Um, so welcome, this is guidance for administrators, but we also sent it out to educators as well. Um, so hopefully we have both administrators and educators in this space. And it's really about what to look for in a three-dimensional science classroom. Um, I'm gonna introduce Sarah Sleesman to come in and say hello really quickly. Sarah, come on in. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Hi, I am Sarah Sleeson. I'm the Science and STEM Director, and I work with Rebecca, who does the majority of our professional learning here today. You will see in the beginning that she's going to provide some opportunities for what we do and what we've been doing in this last year to help support schools around the state of Arizona, as well to talk you through what are the new Arizona science standards and some resources that go with that, as well as, well as like what are those strategies or those shifts in the change of the teaching to um, help support those standards. So thank you, Rebecca. And if you have anything, I'll be on the side, please feel free to send me a message and I'll be taking care of the chat as she goes through. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm Rebecca Gorelli. I am the science and STEM specialist here at the department. Um, I am a former Alhambra Middle School math and science teacher, but before that I was actually an uh, NGSS instructional coach from Chicago. And I basically helped uh, the Chicago Public School System do what I'm doing here in Arizona and that's helping the district moved towards transitioning to three-dimensional science learning and teaching. And so my background is in instructional strategies having to do with the three-dimensional science standards. So what um, we hope that can happen is through this experience, um, we want you to hear about it, learn about it, but then we want you to invite us to come out to your district. So what we're hoping to learn right now is who you are, what's your current position, and we are very curious about how you heard about this opportunity because we've been working on some strategies. So find the chat, introduce yourselves. Now that you know who we are, we'd love to know who you are and that you can see your colleagues in this space. So take a moment, find the chat. What is your position? Are you a superintendent or an academic coach? Are you a principal? Are you a teacher? And how did you hear about this opportunity? Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everybody who's participating in the chat. Oh, maybe from ASTA. We do partner with ASTA all the time, so that's lovely. Good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so we have some principals. We have some curriculum coordinators. Wonderful. So we're all going to engage in this productive struggle today. And I just ask that we all participate as much as possible. We will have time for questions at the end. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I'm just so excited. And I'm just gonna gently push us along, but please continue to participate in the chat and let everybody know who's here. So thank you. One quick announcement is educators, if you're looking for PD or coordinators, if you're looking for opportunities to provide um, your educators. We have six available online self-paced courses right now, and it's basically about watching our recorded webinars. We have a plethora of recorded webinars up, and it's basically getting folks to watch the content, interact with the content, and then we give credit for that interaction. So we do have six available courses. Also, if you are looking for us to come out to your district, we not only can come to your district virtually, we can now come face to face. And I will talk to you a little bit about that right now. We have been working very hard behind the scenes to help educators and administrators and coaches and everybody who influences science education in your district to understand the shifts in instruction that come with three-dimensional learning. 
we have been to all of these districts. Sometimes we come for an hour, sometimes we come for four, sometimes we do full day, sometimes it's virtual, could be face-to-face. -face. We basically can tailor any professional learning opportunity to your needs. And the way it works, and we'll, we also go back. So we've gone to you know a couple of these places more than one time. So we can do some cycles of learning also. So if you're looking to have some contact with us, and I know I have some folks in this space who we have actually been to your district, um, all you have to do is contact us. And I'll go over how to do that in just a second. But really we meet for 30 minutes. I sit down with a planning tool. I ask where you're at. I kind of get a temperature check of your district, ask what you want to focus on, and then we tailor a plan to fit your needs. So I hope you do take us up on that. So how do you contact us? Well, the document that I put in the chat, I'm gonna go over one more time. I put it in the chat, click that link. What it's gonna bring you to is what we call the webinar resource dashboard. Every time we have a professional learning experience, we build one of these with all of the resources we use to create the experience so that you can have all the tools in your back pocket. And the reason we ask you to make a forced copy is that way you have it all by yourself. You're not on the same dock with a million other people. It is yours to do with whatever you want. You can bookmark it, save it for the future, et cetera. Now up here are contact information. So let me go to the dashboard. This is what you should be seeing. And what I'd love is if you have it open and you're ready to go and you're done, could you just put done in the chat? So I have a little anecdotal information of who's ready to continue moving forward. Glorious, thank you. And please do stay on mute the entire time. This is gonna be more of a web seminar kind of, we're gonna do a little bit of interactivity and we'll leave questions to the end. If you need help with technology, Sarah is going to be watching the chat for questions about tech and troubleshooting. Okay, most folks are done. So here we go. Here is our main contact information. If you'd like us to come out to your district, contact us. We'll set up a 30 minute meeting, talk about your needs and make a plan to move forward. Okay, so how this works is throughout the presentation, you're gonna see numbers that look like this on the screen. These are gonna to correlate to the numbers resource in this dashboard. So these are numbered and it has all the resources I use to create this experience for you. If you would like a sample or a, a copy of the slides, we do have it here. It's the slide deck in PDF form. You are welcome to have that and take it and use it. And so the ones that are grade cells here are ones that we're actually going to open and we're going to use during our time together. The ones that are not grayed out are just resources for you that I use to create this experience. So I hope everybody understands the purpose of the dashboard. And here we go. I'm going to invite you to just read over our two goals for today. And so we are here to support you and we have many tools to help with that support. We're also gonna talk a lot about the shifts in science education and what you should be seeing in the classroom that relates to our standards. So let's just ground ourselves and remind ourselves of when we adopted these new three-dimensional standards. They were adopted in fall, 2018. Then we had year one of implementation, year two, year three, which was last year. So last year should have been the year districts had been fully implemented the science standards because that was the first time the Arizona science test was given, which is called AZ SCI. We are going to touch upon AZ SCI, but not until the very end. The reason I wanted to talk about the timeline is for you as the, the leaders in your district to consider and reflect as we move through this experience together, think about where is your district? Because technically this would be year four. So just reflect in your mind the things you see as I engage you in this learning. Where is your district? What is going on in your district? What are you seeing in terms of science? And think about where you're at in implementation. And I wanna also remind us of why we are all here in this space. And before we dive into those instructional shifts, I really want you to think about why we're here. And the reason we're here is to provide access to science literacy for every student that enters our doors, all students. 
And our goal is really to provide that access to science literacy, which is laid out for us in our 2018 Arizona Science Standards, which comes directly from this contemporary piece of research called the Framework for K-12 Science Education. This is one of the documents used to create our standards. And it talks about how we can engage all learners in scientific literacy. And so let's just continue. Another really large piece that comes out of this framework that's embedded in our science standards is the, the pathway forward for this access. And it's something called sense making, putting the kids in the position of the scientist or the engineer to actually figure out the world around them. And we're gonna talk about sense making a little bit later on, but just to kind of ground us in the research behind how our standards were actually developed. This is a long history of research, starting with how people learn and specifically how students learn science in the classroom. This was about 2000, this was 2005. And then over time, new documents came out, new research came out from the NRC, the National Research Council, to get us to this framework, which is one of the main documents our standards were built upon. And there's actually another new document out for science and engineering in the upper grades. So everything we are going to talk to you about actually stems from all this amazing research. And I just wanna pull out some key findings about how students learn science before we get into the shifts. And so there are three key findings that I'd love to summarize for you. I did give you this, this printout though, it is number three in your dashboard if you'd like to read the full document. I'm just gonna summarize a few of the key findings for each of these three points. First and foremost, students' prior knowledge must be engaged. This is a fundamental insight about learning, about new understandings are constructed on a foundation of existing understandings and experiences. Students actually come to our classroom with preconceptions about how the world works, even in kindergarten. Five-year-olds have lived in the natural world for five years they definitely come to us with some understandings about how the world works. And so what does this mean for implications for teaching? It means we need to abandon the model for students coming to us as empty vessels. And we need to view them as not vessels that need to be filled with knowledge, but rather we need to think of the students' heads as filled with a myriad of wonderful ideas and experiences relevant to science. That's the first one. The second one, organizing science knowledge into conceptual frameworks is essential in developing scientific understanding. Well, what does this mean? It means we really, if we want to develop understanding about how the world works and we wanna truly change the way students think about the world around them, the students need a deep foundation of usable knowledge that is organized in their minds as con connected and a conceptual framework. So they know how things are interconnected and then they can make predictions. We call this coherence. We don't just teach one learning sequence on moon phases and then switch to living things. It needs to be constant and coherent and connected. So what we want to think about here is implications for teaching. Moving away from thinking that science is just about memorizing vocabulary and a list of terms and facts. Science is deeply interconnected. And if we provide a conceptual framework for understanding, kids can make sense of the world around them. And finally, metacognition. Learning to monitor one's own thinking is essential. And this, I'm sure we all know, a metacognitive approach, thinking about our thinking for instruction can help students learn to take control of their own learning by engaging them in understanding where they're at how their ideas have changed and moving them forward. And so let's dive into, now that we kind of understand the research behind our framework, which was actually used to build our standards, I'm gonna immerse you in a comparative classroom study. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at two cases and they're not very long, they're pretty short. We have a traditional style classroom that maybe was, um, you know, a little bit old school that we still see in classrooms today versus a classroom that has embraced the shifts in instruction. 
And to help your brain make sense of all of this, here is the task. We're gonna go into what we call the alone zone, which is you committing to your own thinking by yourself before sharing with anybody else in the group. So the alone zone will be you by yourself for 12 minutes. So you are gonna go to number four in your resource document. So let's all go do that. Here it is, classroom case studies. And it is a forced copy again, because I'm gonna ask you to interact with the document by yourself. So I don't want anyone sharing. This way you can edit the document, you can highlight the document, you can interact with it. So if you are ready, please type ready in the chat. Ready means you have the vignettes open and you are ready to begin. And I'll explain what we're going to do. All right, lots of readies. Thank you for that, super helpful. All right, perfect, thank you for the feedback. Okay, here's our task in the alone zone. So we're gonna immerse yourself in these case studies and you're gonna use the highlighting tool. As you read through the, the case study, highlight what the teacher is doing in yellow. Highlight what the student is doing in pink. Underline the science. So here is an example of what it should look like when you are finished. I use the highlighting tools. I use pink, I use yellow, and I highlighted the science. So that is what we're going to do. I ask that we go into the alone zone and put that reflection hat on and consider these questions. Where do the questions come from? Who is involved in figuring out how to answer the questions? And how do students get to that explanation? What is the role of agreement, disagreement, and consensus? So just think about this stuff as you engage in this task. I am going to start the timer right now for 12 minutes. So right now we should be highlighting, underlining, and I'll put the instructions back up. Okay, hopefully at this point you have finished the task. And now that you've had time to think by yourself, which is a critical component of sense making, you went into the alone zone, now you are prepared with your own thoughts that you can share. So I'm gonna give you some think time here. And then in the chat, consider responding to one of these questions. So how are these two classrooms similar and or different? What do you notice by just viewing, making observations of this case and the colors, this case and the colors, and just please share one takeaway. So find the chat, think for a moment and engage in the chat. What did you notice about this? How are they the same or different? Uh, Amanda, case one, teacher gives the technical answers right away versus the kids figuring it out them on their own. Very awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we see more pink on this side. Same oh, somebody noticed it is the same content, but the way they were engaged was more active in Miss Lee's class. Yes. Higher teach. Okay. Very much teacher driven in case one. Excellent. So I'm seeing some themes here. We see a lot of student exploration in both. Right. This is case one. We are not saying is a, a technically a bad teacher. But we're talking about the shifts in science. We have to think about the shifts. More student interaction. Yeah, I can see the pink. It's visibly apparent. I have evidence to support that claim right there. Perfect. Okay, yeah. And so just, I'm going to gently push us along, but 
please continue to collaborate in the chat and give some ideas. And really, if you just look at these two with just the color coding, Miss, it is the same content. Miss Sheridan is, a, is an okay teacher, but it's where do we put the position of the students? Are they in the position of the figuring out as the scientist or the engineer? Or is it the teacher front loading and explaining everything? And so what research says is if we really want kids to make sense of the world around them and be successful and apply science in the real world, then we definitely have to shift instruction to Miss Lee's sort of style. And so that's the whole we're gonna go down and travel through right now is how do we take something so traditional, same content, and how do we actually shift it to be more student in the position of the scientists where they are figuring out the world around them and sense making with their peers rather than having the teacher be the sage on the stage. We want the teacher to be the guide on the side. And let's talk about two labels for instruction. And so if you think about instruction as a continuum, on one side of the continuum, we have what's called the information frame. This is the traditional style of teaching science where the teacher's main focus is to provide information, give out information to the kids, mainly vocabulary. Students are positioned to just focus on memorizing those facts and knowing that information. Science is just this, it's portrayed then as this body of isolated terms that we just need to define. And assessments are only focused on the right answers. Think of multiple choice and just simple, simple close-ended questions. And what we learned about science over the years is that this frame was actually asking students to just know about science and come to the other side of the continuum with me. On the other side is what we call the sense-making frame. This is where teacher is, the teacher's focused on conceptual understanding. If I can understand condensation on my glass, well, I can then understand clouds in the sky. That's what conceptual understanding is. Students are then focused on understanding something and not just memorizing vocabulary. Science is now an avenue through which we can make sense of something and assessments are now gonna be focused on using evidence to support their ideas. So the shift with our new standards is shifting from knowing about the world around us to figuring out the world around us. And with that comes these three shifts that are in this research document called the framework which our standards were built upon. So I just wanna to touch on three of the main shifts. There's more shifts, but we're just gonna focus on three. One, explaining phenomena or designing solutions to problems. So we do have engineering. Engineering is identifying a problem and designing a solution. We have engineering embedded in our standards. Second, doing science, hands-on three-dimensional inquiry-based constructivist theory science. And we're gonna talk about the three dimensions in just a second. And as I already mentioned, coherent learning progressions. We're not gonna teach condensation one day and switch to the moon the next. It has to be coherent and make sense over time. And so we're gonna now read this great document called A New Vision for Science Education, and it explains the shifts. So if you can follow me to the dashboard and grab number five, this is the last, um, we actually have two more interactive pieces this is the second one. So grab number five right here. It's a PDF. You're not gonna highlight anything. You're just gonna read it. And then we're gonna come back together and talk about it. And so what I love about this document and the way I recommend reading this and let me wait and see if everybody's ready. I forgot to do my check real quick. Tell me if you are ready for me to continue in the chat. Do you have number five open, which looks like this? Perfect, thank you. All right, if you're ready, this is science on the left. It's what will science education involve less of and where are we moving towards? So I like to read this document as like a left right column. This is the old way. Here's kind of where we're progressing towards. So we will have three minutes to read this document. And then when we call come back, we're going to engage in what's called a waterfall chat. And I'll explain how that works when the time comes. So Think about three to five items that really stick out to you about the shifts of science education. Okay, three minutes alone zone. Okay, five seconds left. 
Okay. So now that you've had time to think by yourself first, I'm going to ask that you commit to your thinking in the chat, and then we're going to share. And I'm modeling for you what we need to be doing with students that relates to our standards. We need to give kids alone time to commit to their own thinking before they share with a group. So we're gonna do a waterfall chat. And here's how this works. Basically, you're gonna find the chat. I'm gonna put the timer at 30 seconds. And at the end, when it goes off, I'm gonna say three, two, one, you hit enter and all the knowledge and all the thoughts waterfalls into the chat. So find the chat box, begin writing. What is, what is sticking out to you? What, what's your takeaway from this document? Think about something that you would like to share and start typing in the chat, but do not hit enter just yet. Okay, so I'm going to count down and hit enter. Three, two, one, go ahead. Let's see. Asking questions, students focused, teacher driven. Yes, variety of sources, student lender. Yes, okay, I'm already seeing a pattern in the data that you presented in the chat. Students are doing, students in the position, students not teacher driven, more authentic. It is how we learn ourselves. Thank you, William. Fantastic. I agree with you. Look at students as curious. Yes, let's make them curious so that they wonder and they can ask questions and then figure out the world around them. Oh, this is beautiful, thank you. So I'm just gonna gently push us along. Please feel free to continue. And I just wanna, with this shift, we actually did the same thing with teachers down in Coolidge, but instead of a waterfall chat, we asked them to make a word cloud. And I love the word, word cloud because it really gets at the heart of how science has shifted. And this is what we should be seeing in classrooms. So on the left side, you can see traditional style in our 2004 standards was really about memorizing vocabulary, about oversimplification and one right answer, using pre-planned outcomes, teacher-led, teacher-teacher, lecture, wrote, one right answer, teacher-driven. And again, as a reminder, we were having kids learn about science, learn about vocabulary, and that's about it. And the shift, look at this side, engage, explore, explain. Some of those five E's from the five E instructional model are in here. Investigating, exploring, arguing, uh, open-ended, providing evidence, engaging. So the shift, if there's one takeaway from this experience, it's we're shifting from just learning about isolated facts to figuring out the world around us. And so with that, I'm just gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison of our old standards versus our new standards. Now, here on the left, I have a fourth grade energy and magnetism standard. Performance objectives, which if you remember, are those teeny tiny little skills that were perceived as a checkoff list for teachers to just kind of get through. So performance objective two says to construct series and parallel electric circuits. I want you to envision what's going on in the classroom if they are engaging in this skill. When I looked at this, I thought about, okay, we have some circuits, we have some light bulbs, we have maybe some batteries. I give the kids a procedure and they follow it step by step by step. They put together different kinds of circuits and yay, the light bulb goes on. But what I wonder about that is do the students actually understand how energy flows through a system? What happens if something happens inside of that system and the light bulb doesn't go on? Do they have enough understanding to figure out how to solve that problem? And so what we were doing with this is this isn't bad stuff. Building circuits isn't bad, but it's how we position the students. Instead of telling them what to do, take a look at how it's the exact same content, the same stuff, but the approach is different with our new standard. This is still in fourth grade, but look at this. It says to develop and use a model that explains how energy is moved from place to place through in the circuit or through a current. Now, if you look at develop and use a model, it's bolded 
because that's a science and engineering practice. It's a verb. It's a thing we do to make sense of circuits. The word develop means I'm going to have an initial model, then I'm going to learn some more. I'm going to come back. I'm going to revise my thinking. Then I'm going to learn some more. I'm going to talk to my peers. I'm going to engage with my teacher, my whole class. We're going to come back and we're going to revise it a third time. And then we're actually going to use that model to explain how the system works. So if we just look at these side by side, it is very different in how we approach teaching science. And so how were our standards created? Well, they were written from, as I've been mentioning, this fabulous book, The Framework, but it was also built, our Arizona standards were built with another research document called Working with Big Ideas of Science Education. Now, the next generation science standards, which are the national standards, we do not adopt them. But those standards are actually built from the framework as well. And in the framework are the three dimensions, which we're going to talk about next. So both Arizona and the national set of standards come, were developed from this research. What makes us different from the national standards, not only did we not adopt the full set, we included a second research document that the NGSS does not. That is why we are not an NGSS state, but we are called a framework-based state because they were built on the framework. So what's in this amazing book that I keep talking about? Well, if you opened it, and I did give you a PDF version of both of those documents in, in the resource page. If I open this book on, in chapter three, I'd find the first dimension of what we call three-dimensional science instruction. Dimension one, are these things called the practices, the verbs of what we do to make sense of the world around us. The, uh, chapter four is the second dimension, cross-cutting concepts, and I'll explain those in a little bit. Chapters five, six, and seven are basically the content, the core ideas, physical, life, earth, and space science. And so let's look at these in what we call the pinwheel. These are interactive parts that kind of move around. And the base of our pinwheel are the eight science and engineering practices, the active engaging part of doing science, things like engaging an argument from evidence, constructing an explanation, using a model, asking questions, analyzing data. Then in the center, we have seven cross-cutting concept lenses through which we want students to think, to gather evidence about a specific phenomenon. And then the core ideas are here, life, earth, and space science. None of that is different. We still teach the same content. It's how we approach science that is different. And so we have one great tool. If you'd like to look at it, I'm gonna show you a video in just a second of three-dimensional instruction and what it looks like. And um, if you would like to look at one of our tools that we use, number seven has this snapshot. It's basically like a placemat that has all of our dimensions written on it. So dimension one is up here, dimension two, and then down here, our third dimension is both these yellow and purple boxes. So if you wanna have this out while you watch the video, it is number seven in the dashboard, just so you can kind of make some understanding of what are these dimensions? What do I see in the video? Go ahead and grab that. If you don't want to, that's okay too. But we are gonna watch this video that it can explain three-dimensional science instruction much better than I ever could. And as you watch this video, it's about six to seven minutes long. Think about the shifts. What are the teachers literally doing in the video to engage in three-dimensional instruction? How do the dimensions work together? So let me grab that video real quick. <laughs> When we learn things, it isn't for memorizing a piece of information. Just reciting science facts or principles is not what we want children to be able to do. We want them to be able to go out in the world and make sense of novel phenomena. So making sense of things really is engaging in a performance and saying, I need to construct an explanation of why or how this occurs. Okay, let's get started. Are you ready? 56. Throughout 56. the two days, I want you to engage as the scientist, you as the student, you as the learner. If it was room temperature water, would it be behaving in the same way? What's the science behind this? What's happening? 
As teachers start focusing on the next generation science standards, they will be able to help students see science as it really is, that it's not just a set of steps and procedures. The real hope is that they can make a connection between what we do in the modeling of performances of science and what they do in their classroom. Oh, wow. In this day and age, one of the factors influencing the next generation science standards is the globalization, understanding we're in a global community. We're not kind of an isolated entity here. The next generation science standards takes the vision from the framework for K-12 science education and puts it into a set of performance expectations. And it calls for the students to actively engage in science. It sets out parameters for science education, clear goals, along with describing the three dimensions that students can engage in to make sense of science. Three dimensions are the cross-cutting concepts, the science and engineering practices, and the disciplinary core ideas. Most of those ideas are not new. The integration of them, pulling those three dimensions together, is new. If we're going to have the kids doing that, instruction has to reflect that. What I'm walking away from today, kind of a big shift for me, is we can focus in on something very specific to help teach a much broader, bigger idea, that it actually helps the students be able to do that application to new scenarios, new situations. Cross-cutting concepts. There's seven of them. And the way we've organized them is around causality, structure and function, systems, scale and proportion, change and stability, matter and energy, and then the last thing, patterns. These cross-cutting concepts are tools that you provide to the children, and they use those tools to make sense of phenomena. So we're looking for changes in the system. There's condensation on the outside. The cross-cutting concepts are a way of organizing the phenomena in terms of what the system is that's being studied. What did you define as your system? We included in our system also the surrounding air. The idea that there's a cause-effect relationship. It's causing the cloudiness. That's causing the bubbles to come off of the ice. It's going to get pushed in the direction of the wind, right? Mm -hmm. And finally, patterns used as evidence to support their explanations. So to me, the pattern is just the fluttering back and forth, right? Do you have a question in mind? Why that pattern, that the back, back and, and forth. forth pattern? What yeah. if we change the direction of the flag, if we turn it this way? Okay. I want to go inside and make a little paper flag that we can blow on and manipulate. The practices are a set of things that children do in engaging in science performances. Asking questions right here, that's what students do. As a professional teacher, you have to create an environment in which students are asking questions that help them make sense of things. Ready? 150. Why doesn't that ball return to that exact same level that you dropped it? Engaging students in the practices really does pique their curiosity, and it helps them have a desire to go out and have more questions about the world, which asking questions is a practice. So it's something we want them to be able to do and to be able to discover more about the world. What else contributes to it not reaching its maximum height that it started at? The pull of gravity. Gravity is still pulling it back down even though it's bouncing up. As learners, using evidence and using that evidence to construct explanations is important. I think having those experiences will really help students own the content. So more more bounce, yeah. more energy in the bounce, right. and that's really the kinetic energy. The last dimension of the core ideas, and there's nothing new here. We don't want kids at the end of instruction to recite the core ideas. We want them to use them in science performances to make sense of novel phenomena, applying them to construct exclamations and develop arguments. So the alcohol is less dense than the ice, as you can see. The density in there is different. Oh, yeah. The core ideas in particular become valuable because we revisit them through every grade band, and they're moving forward in a very logical way. Those things we're asking them to do can be applied to more than just alcohol and water. It can be applied to cloud formation. It can be applied to condensation. Why? What's happening? 
I think what's exciting about the Next Generation Science Standards is this intersection of the three dimensions and that we're not just working on practices one day. You really are infusing the three dimensions within the classroom. One of the things that you've done is asking what if. By doing that, I have to be able to take what I know, what I've learned, looking at the models, looking at patterns, and applying them somehow to show that I understand what would happen if I changed a dynamic. It's been real helpful to remember that, you know, I can't do one without thinking about the other. No change, we should add that, right? That's how students are going to be thinking about them as well. It's oh, cute. It's my hope that this will be the reform in science education that not only gets students more proficient in science, but builds interest in science. Okay, come on back. And I just wanted to let you know the man you saw there, Brett Molding, has actually been out to Arizona to help us write three-dimensional lessons that fit our standards for the past three years. So that cup with the ice phenomena, we actually have a total full immersion, like a half day PD, I can do it in three hours to help teachers understand the shifts in instruction. So if you would like your teachers to engage in this as learners, we can do that. And that is one example. And we have that lesson already written for uh, Arizona standards. It's actually falls in fifth grade. So as a reminder, our three dimensions are a little bit different than the next generation science standards. And the reason is, is because we pulled in that other research document. However, up here in dimension one, that's the exact same as the national standards and same with the cross cutting concepts number two. However, the difference is, is how we organize our core ideas or content. So we have core ideas of knowing science here and the core ideas of using science. A little bit different than the next generation science standards, but these two dimensions are exactly the same. So just as a reminder, I'm gonna show us how to read the coding of a standard just to connect everything we've learned so far is when we look at science standards, the first letter or number indicates the grade level. The second uh, correlation here is E1, U1. That's earth science core idea number one and then U1, using science, core idea number one. So that's one of the dimensions is this combination. And then this is just an arbitrary identifier. So this would be kindergarten standard three, this is second grade standard four. Now, if you actually look at the standard, do you see how there's bolding at the beginning of every one of our standards? Well, that's a dimension. That's the science and engineering practice, the verb at which we're gonna engage the students in doing science. And then things like patterns, you'll see cross-cutting concepts kind of sprinkled in here. We see change, stability and change. They're kind of sprinkled in and it's up to teachers to figure out which cross-cutting concept they really want to focus on. So let's just review. E1 comes from here. It's earth science core idea one having to do with the composition of the earth. And then U1 relates to this in the snapshot. I just want to help connect those ideas with the dimension. And so this is what our standards document looks like. I'm just gonna review the parts and pieces so that we're all on the same messaging here about what this document is used for and how to read it. First and foremost, as I just mentioned, P2U1, Physical Science Core Idea 2, Using Science Core Idea 1. That's a dimension, one of the three dimensions, which is the core idea. You will see every single one of our standards has a practice, a science and engineering practice at the beginning of it, and then the cross-cutting concepts, the third dimension, there's seven of them. We have a few bolded that we think fit best with the standards, but it's ultimately up to the educator to decide which lens through which they want the students to gather more evidence about that specific phenomenon. Now, the background information I do want to clarify is there's been some misconceptions in the field about what this is. This is certainly not a checkoff list of vocabulary. We are not in the position of uh, just front loading vocabulary and teaching vocabulary anymore. This is background information, literally verbatim from the research. And how do I know that? Well, there's in-text citations that help me understand that. Number two means it came from this research document. And if there's a number four, that means it came from this. So this is actually the research that was used to create the standard on this side. It is not a checkoff list of vocabulary 
to teach. Same for high school. So they have something a little bit different. We have 28 essential standards, which are here. And then we have plus standards, which are there to go a little bit deeper and allow districts to create different course pathways. That's why they're there. And everything else is the same for high school. That's the only difference. And so let's talk about how science actually works. We're gonna watch a one to two minute clip of this, and then we're gonna move on to the last portion of this, of what should you see in the classroom. So I want you to watch this and think about what you see in your classrooms across your district of how educators are engaging students in science. And I want you to think about it because this is actually how science works in the real world. And so let me get this clip going real quick and just think about how science actually works. A couple years ago, a group of citizen scientists from the Western Cave Conservancy discovered a large, odd-looking spider in a cave in Southern Oregon. They sent it to scientists in California. Recently, those scientists declared that spider a new species, Trogloraptor, and a member of a new family of spiders. Sounds straightforward, right? Wrong. Science definitely is not a linear step-by-step -step fashion. And science is unpredictable. It's uh, dynamic. And I don't think it ever concludes. It just keeps going. To communicate the real process of science, Judy and her colleagues developed this science flowchart to better explain how science works. You may start in one area and you find the need to communicate with the community of scientists that you work with who might have additional or other ideas and all of that helps to shape what science is and how we go about the process of science. So let's take a look at the Trogloraptor discovery flowchart. It's less like a linear process and more like a pinball machine. Let's follow the path using the spider that the citizen scientists found as the pinball. They sent it to scientist Tracy Audizio who is very curious about what lives in caves. She examined it for about two hours one night, trying to identify it by making observations and conferring with a colleague. They were stumped. Okay. We are actually going to come back because I think you got where we're going next. What we see in classrooms today is a linear way of teaching science. And that is actually known as the scientific method. The scientific method you will not find in this research anywhere. So I want to introduce you to another research document. This is called STEM Teaching Tool number 32, and I did provide it for you. It's number 10 in your dashboard, but I pulled out my favorite paragraph from this research. So I'm going to invite you to read over the screen really quickly of what this says. And I want us to just reflect about what we see happening in our classrooms and ask ourselves internally, is that in relation? Does that fit? Does it align with what is in this research document that was actually used to create our standards? Now, scientific method can be something scientists do, but it's really a messy process and it's all over the place. It's not this linear progression that we do every time we do science. And this is something we need to move away from because that way of doing science is actually how student uh, scientists write a report about their findings. It is not how they do science. So think about that shift as you are supporting educators in your district. Secondly, there's one more issue about objectives on a board um, that I'd like to introduce you to. Maybe you haven't thought about this before. And so I gave you another research tool called STEM teaching tool number 46. How do we define meaningful daily learning objectives? And if you are a district that asks teachers to put these on the board, I'm going to ask that you read this paragraph and just be mindful of what you're asking teachers. 
to do. So please, I'm going to invite you to read this excerpt from that research document. And so again, when you are supporting educators, reflect on what you've heard in this presentation today and what you're asking teachers to put on the board, if that's an, you know, uh, a mandatory thing. If not, okay. If it is though, we do not want students to know what they're gonna figure out. That's the whole purpose of science is to figure out the world around us. So we need to be mindful of what we put on the board. And so if this is a struggle, I have a solution. We have these fabulous documents called the vertical progressions. We have them for each of the three dimensions. Now, if we're wondering about what could be used for objectives on the board, this is the tool. These are called elements, specific pieces of knowledge and skill that make up that practice and they're grade band appropriate. They increase in sophistication over time, but if I'm asking students to develop and use a model as one of the practices, these are the things I could put on the board if I needed to put something on the board. It does not give away the content, the core idea of what they're going to figure out. Photosynthesis is a process that is, you know, what plants use to make their food. We don't want to tell students that because their job is to figure that out through the three dimensions. So just be mindful of that. We also have this for the cross-cutting concepts. So I could use objectives like Students will be able to put pattern, use patterns as evidence. That's a fantastic goal. If students can use patterns as evidence in an explanation, that's amazing. And so just be mindful, and we do have tools to help with that. And they're called the vertical progressions. I gave them to you in your resource dashboard, but they're all on our main science standards website as well. And then a loan zone one more time before we leave, I do ask that you take this. We're going to move this down to two minutes. This document is for you as administrators. It's a look for document and it is number 14 in your dashboard. This is the last one I'm going to ask you to read. This comes right from our website. We built an administrator's toolkit that has this in it. And it, it, it calls out three look fors. And so I do want you to focus on what it says up here at the top though, because this is not a checkoff list to be used for observations by any means. So three minutes, let's do two minutes of alone time, alone zone time to read that document. So just read over it, I'll give us two minutes. Okay, hopefully you found it. Okay, almost there.
All right, and for our remaining five minutes, I'm going to break down what you should see in a classroom that aligns with our standards. <coughs> and it will be very quick. Here we go. Oh, again, super important. This is not a checklist for observations. It's for you to understand the shifts and that what we see in the classroom is not what we used to see in a traditional style classroom. We need to shift. And so let's talk about these. First is sense making with phenomena. There was tons of phenomena in that video you watched, like the ice in the in the cup. So phenomena is naturally occurring events that happen around us, like big waves move sand more than little waves. Naturally occurring event, I can figure out why that's happening. Absolutely. A phenomena, sailboats move when the wind blows. Something I can see, I can observe it. Can I explain what's causing it to happen? Absolutely, that's science. Leaves are darker on the top than the bottom. Maybe you didn't know that, but that's true of leaves. And there's a reason for it. So we can figure out why that's happening. So we are not seeing phenomena in our classrooms, or if it's engineering, we should be seeing not a phenomena, but a problem to solve. And we should be seeing the science engineering practices and the cross cutting concepts. So again, we need to flip it upside down put the students in the position of the scientist with the teacher as the guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. Look for two, making thinking visible, notebooks in the classroom, visible thinking, any way for kids to do this. How do we elicit their initial ideas, have them engage in opportunities to show us what they know? We have to think about it and giving them time to revise models. That's what develop means, not just one and done. We're gonna revise it over time. So how are we making thinking visible? Notebooks are a great way to do that, but educators need to understand the structures through which to have students make their thinking visible. And finally, the third one, engaging all students equitably in a science community and culture that values every human. So sometimes in traditional style classrooms, we see what's called the IRE talk pattern. The teacher asks a question, student raises the hand, gives the proper response, the teacher evaluates it right on cue. That is what we need to move away from. We need a different pattern called productive talk, which is about the teacher poses something, one student answers, then connects to another student. Can you add on? Can you clarify? Can you provide evidence? We have to build discourse in our classrooms. So things like student talk. If we do have a whole discourse PD, if your teachers would like to engage in that, we have one that's about an hour and a half to two hours, we can come out and show them how to do this with students. And again, I did give you this resource. These are nine talk moves that we use in the classroom to help with science thinking. But again, it's not me talking to the students, it's student to student to student to student to student, then back to me. And I'm the guide on the side. And so thinking of your districts, what instructional model do you use for science? Do you use the 5E instructional model? Do you use culturally relevant? Any of these, there are place-based, model-based, project-based inquiry, all different kinds of instructional models fit with our standards. But we have to have some sort of model that is based in inquiry. And again, I gave you the research brief behind this, it's number 16. One more reminder is we do have recommendations of minutes. So if we really want students by the time they get to fifth grade to understand the world more deeply around them, we definitely need to have minutes allotted for science. This is recommended, it's in our standards document. And remember that our science standards inform the new science test. So we do not advocate for teaching to the test. We advocate for shifts in instruction because the science test will actually have phenomena. They have to provide evidence they have to uh, manipulate things and do and think. They have to figure out what's happening. And so if we can shift instruction, then we do not need to worry about how our students will do on this test because they will be equipped with the tools and be empowered to be successful. And one more thing on our main science standards website, we have a whole administrator's toolkit and a plethora of recorded webinars and online courses. So that is all we have for today. I will stay on for questions, but thank you for being here. I hope you found some useful tools. And again, if you want us to come out to your district and tailor something for your needs, 
just email us to get the process started and I will walk you through how it works. So thank you for being here. Reminder that I will be sending up a follow-up and you will get your certificates through ADE Connect. So if you'd like to stay on, you're welcome to stay on. We're gonna use a strategy called Stack to build a virtual line. Thank you all for being here. If you have a question, all I'm gonna ask is that you type Stack into the chat and that way I can call on you. And we'll stop sharing and we will stop recording. I can't find the button.